the Rock News Weekly Podcast, week of April 8th, 2024, season 6, episode number 14. This week, we talk about KISS selling their entire music catalog, logo, image, and likeness for millions in a huge landmark deal. ACDC selling 1.5 million tickets in just one day for their upcoming European tour. And Adrian Ballou, Tony Levin, Steve Vai, and Danny Carey sit down to discuss the origins, inspirations, and plans for their newly announced beat tour, which will focus on the 80s era of King Crimson and more. Plus this week in rock and roll history trivia, weekly WTF, and so much more. Everything's up, rocknewsweekly.com. Watch us live every Sunday, twitch.tv slash rocknewsweekly, and on demand, youtube.com at rocknewsweekly. All right, it's time for the Rock News Weekly Podcast. What's up, everybody? Chris here as well as David. David, how's it going, man? I'm good. Uh, nice, man. So how we, we missed you last week. How was the, uh, how was the uh, holiday week for you? You know, it was relaxing. It nice. was uh, pretty nice. Got to do some activities. Went out of town a little bit. Got to go snowboarding. Nice. Yeah, it was nice. Very cool. All right, well, let's get to the Rock News this week, April 8th. We got lots to talk about, as you just heard on the intro. Kiss selling their entire catalog. ACDC selling out their European tour. Um, and a bunch of other stuff, especially with the guys from the Beat Tour, Adrian Ballou, uh, Ballou Tony Levin, Steve Vai, Danny Carey. We're going to talk about all that stuff coming up. Check us out, rocknewsweekly.com. Follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, all at Rock News Weekly. Same as uh, YouTube. Watch everything on demand. Watch us live, twitch.tv slash rocknewsweekly. We're live right now. And uh, let's get to this interview. So there was an interview. You missed it last week, David. We were talking about this kind of super group that um, was announced and the tour that was announced. Um, Beat performing the 80s albums. Discipline, three of a perfect pair and Beat from King Crimson. Hasn't been attempted uh, by any group uh, ever. And uh, it, we've heard different incarnations of Tony Levin's Stick Men and Adrian Ballou's Power Trio doing different uh, versions of King Crimson tracks. But this seems to be the most kind of comprehensive they're going to delve straight into these albums. Uh, it's a really cool interview on Rick Beato's YouTube channel, so I recommend checking it out in full and supporting his uh, YouTube channel as well. I'm going to play a couple little clips of the interview here. Um, Adrian talking about how it started, um, the origins of uh, King Crimson, Danny Carey talking about how he got involved, Tony talking about his rig, Steve Vai talking about how he's going to interpret Robert Fripp's guitar, which is kind of like a you know doing your best to do an eddie van halen uh he's very signature very disciplined style of music so uh it's gonna be a really interesting live show i got tickets uh for the show in napa so i'm gonna be going cool yeah i got a meet and greet uh i splurged for the meet and greet and we got front row seats so wow. I'm, I'm really That's excited great. for it yeah it's kind of a bucket list show for me so i'll report back and I'll show my photo, and if you know all that stuff comes to fruition like it should, that'll be in September. So I uh, can't wait for that. So let's get to this interview, though. I'm sure you guys want to hear it. Um, I listened to this. Uh, it's a great interview. Uh, Rick Beato uh, YouTube channel. So check it out. Here it is. Okay. Tell me about how this project got started. All right. We had a producer in the David Bowie band that we do. Mm-hmm. Uh, celebrating David Bowie. His name is Scroat. He and I were discussing the idea that, you know, the music of the 80s that I was a part of with King Crimson should be played again somehow. I had called Robert Fripp and said, do you realize that in two years it's going to be the 40th anniversary of the first record we did, Discipline? And w I think we should try to do something with that. And he declined eventually. He, we talked about it, but finally he declined. But he said to me, well, but if you want to do something with it and you want to drive it, go for it. And he would try to support it. So we started talking and I said, well, first of all, you've got to find the right person to re replace Robert. And if that, you know, someone who can at least do what he does in their own way. And I said, the only one I can think of is, is, is Steve Vai. So... I called Steve and he was amazingly excited about the idea and he, you know, he said, I love that music and you know, da da da. And I thought, oh wow, this is great then. So we started thinking, Scrot and I, where we go from here. Steve recommended someone who couldn't do it, eventually couldn't do it, and we never got to the bass player. We never got that far because of something called COVID. So 
Then COVID happened, two years go by, call Steve back. Well, yeah, I'm still really excited, but I've got 18 months of touring booked ahead of me. <laughs> okay. The so finally long story short, we finally got to the point where it was possible to do this. And consequently, at that point, it was possible to have Tony Levin because he was no longer on tour with Peter Gabriel. And then I went to see Tool. They're, they're old friends of mine, Danny Carey. And I said, there's no one I'd rather, I can't imagine anyone doing Bill Bruford better than, wow. than him because I knew his background. He said the same thing, that the Discipline album really was a changing point musically in his life. And then we had it, you know? And then it was just down to putting it all together with the production team. Miles Copeland is at the head of that. And we have a guy named Steve O'Glendinning from London. So nice team of people put together, ready to go. Our booking agent was just here telling us it's a go. Mm -hmm. Fortunate for us because it was just announced all <laughs> over the internet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Tony, you joined King Crimson that year, right? In 1981 81, for the yeah, Discipline, you're right. Discipline record. Both of you guys, that mm -hmm. was your first record. So those, those three records, have the three primary colors, discipline and beat, and um, three, three, of three, of a, pair. three of a perfect pair. Now, you haven't played this music since how long? How long well, would, it, would does, it be? Well, it does uh, come up in a few bands we play in, right. in, in different versions of it, and probably maybe all of us. So, so some I haven't played some, most of it in a long, long okay. time. Some of it you have played, though. Sure. Not to mention with King Crimson, but some of it with King Crimson, and some of it in other bands. I've even done jazz versions of some of it in a jazz band I'm in, but most of it I have not played in a really long time. Okay, so Danny, what about, have you played through the songs? Like, as a kid, did you play to these records? Mm, I played to them, like yeah. in my parents' attic or uh -huh. something, you know, but uh, I've never performed them live, really, to speak of, other than sitting in with Adrian. And Actually, we have there. played frame by frame and Thela and Jinji oh, that's right. quite a few times when we sat in. Trio, yeah. trio thing, maybe, yeah, because, and the, the stick men were on that one run, weren't they? Yeah. So we all... Yeah. Yep. Like we would play and then you guys would play and then I think at the end we'd all yep. get together and have a crazy jam on some cool crimson stuff. This is the man who's not played this music yeah. at <laughs> all, right here. No pressure. <laughs> I, I certainly oogled at it quite often, you know. I, oogled I, or googled? Go, well, no, both. Oogled. <laughs> both. Uh, well, but my history is when I was young, I was exposed to Robert Fripp on exposure. And I knew that there was something going on there that was different. You know, one, this, one thing is different than the others. And I just uh, was attracted to his musical mind and his creativity. Um, I hardly played the guitar you know, so long ago. <clears throat> so I kind of followed through the years and I loved the old King Crimson stuff. Uh, in the 80s, when those three records came out, they were really monoliths because they uh, especially for someone like myself, because they really showcased a complexity that scratches a particular itch that I have that I can't, you can't, nothing else really reaches, but it's accessible. And having uh, Adrian in that band at that time and Tony was a masterstroke because there's a, there's a beautiful balance of accessibility. You don't have to be a muso, you know, but the parts that they were, contributing were just brilliant you know just just beautiful and i would listen deeply to the music and i'd i'd hear what's going on you know because i was very interested in that kind of stuff right you know and i'd worked with frank and yes and um which was my first exposure to adrian both you guys yeah absolutely uh, you know i'd watch baby snakes over and over and over you know <laughs> and uh it's three hours long i know and i watched it over and over i'm and guilty over. too yeah <laughs> uh and just really um kind of from a distance followed everybody through that through the years after that uh, but those records were like little gems you know never did i ever think i would be performing the stuff and when when adrian first called uh the first thing that went through my mind is ah it, it, i didn't know he was actually even referring to the king crimson stuff i'm saying this is the first minute you know right <laughs> and i'm thinking oh wow adrian Ballou, steve Vai, i think that's there's something really great there you know i think we can get into some 
because we're we're kind of different, but we kind of have an attraction to the absurd. You know, on right. the guitar is right. something you know because I'm I'm attracted to you because you're absurd. <laughs> <laughs> that makes all so you, you, you do and all with my the fans. <laughs> <laughs> but um, then, as soon as it dawned on me that he was referring to the King Crimson music, I just went, <gasps> and I, you know, a shock went through me because the, the first thing I thought was, uh, how does Robert feel about this? Right, he's like a scientist, but it's not just his picking technique. You know, it's his um, his musical mind, his his uh, the way that he approaches um, time signatures and and polymeter stuff. The way yeah. that these guys do all that uh, was so attractive to me. But the picking technique, that, that's like, uh, you know, something that is uh, personal, you know, to him. And he perfected it, you know. So I, I started listening to the music and I'm thinking, I go, okay, all right, you know, okay, all right. And then I, I got the uh, song book. This song book, it's a beautifully transcribed manuscript book of those Amazing. three records. It's yes. very specific because, you know, Crimson fans are fiercely loyal and they, in every little you right. know, thing and every especially nuance. Fripp fans and Adrian fans they can get every little mm -hmm. thing and, and, and what Tony does you know so this was a little bible and I started looking it's at it it's not that little actually I, it's, it's a big bi yeah, <laughs> bible yeah it's, it's like a, a big bible <laughs> I've been in this kind of a situation you know in that I when I joined Alcatraz I had to play Ingve yeah. music and of course mm -hmm. I don't play like him but I did my best to honor the music mm -hmm. and to bring his fans something that, you know. And when I joined Dave Roth's band, you know, that was the voice that had Edward behind it yeah. that everybody knew. So uh, I just knew that I had to put my best foot forward. I, I'm not Edward. You know, I, I don't play like that. But I really loved the music and I could do it in a particular way. So I did my best with that to honor his fans, that music. And with this, it's the same thing. You know, I'm, uh, there's stuff that, you know, I'm, that's, you know, well, that is integral. And that uh, the thing I love about it also, it's, it's, it's going to require me to <clears throat> hunker down <laughs> and shed, you know, like really uh, focus on. Yeah, uh, trying to develop some kind of uh, technique that can cover some of the stuff he was doing. And, and some stuff will have to be, you know, merged into what Steve might do, you know. <laughs> but it's such beautiful music. I'm listening to this, and after I'm getting over the shock, you know, I'm going, oh, my goodness, this stuff is just, it's just, it's magnificent to play. <laughs> Pretty cool. So the kind of the cool little history there behind how all these guys kind of know each other, how everything kind of came to be. Uh, so, yeah. What do you think of all that? that? I mean, to me, that's that's in, in a very enriching little uh, couple minutes there. Yeah. Seeing the interaction. Like yeah. they're really sort of like this this little community that interacts often. They're selling stuff. It reminds me of like how skateboarders used to be back in the day. Right. Like they're, you know, they're hanging out, it, they're like, they talk to technical stuff and then they've got their, um, sort of, you know, it's that feeling when you know people who know what you, what you know. Yeah. They know what they're talking about. And, they know and, what they know. You know, and there's yeah. only a few people that can appreciate it quite in that same way. Yeah, definitely. It's fun to see that. I mean, yeah, it really it is. It's a, they just love their, they love music. Yeah. And they that's, love to make that's it. where it comes. It comes from this place of kind of honesty and, uh, passion and they're just musicians talking shop and excited to take on this challenge. And so, yeah, it's really a, a cool thing. I want to get a picture of these uh, tour dates here for you guys. Here it is at beat-tour.com. Uh, as, as I mentioned, I'm going to be checking out the Napa show at the Blue Note Summer Sessions at Meritage Resort in Napa. So I'm, I'm very excited to check that out. It sounds really fancy and cool. Uh, San Jose, they're going to be in L.A., Anaheim, San Diego for the California dates. Then they're going all over, including a stop in Toronto, Montreal. Uh, they're all over Canada. Uh, they do like five shows there. And then a bunch of East Coast states. They come to, through the Midwest and back to Las Vegas um, at the Virgin Hotel in, in November. So it looks to be a really awesome tour. Of course, people are uh, hoping that it's going to be more than this, a world tour possibly. They're very big in Japan. Um, you know, King Crimson and some of these other uh, super fans of these musicians. 
uh, would love to see this tour. So hopefully it does sell out wherever they go on this U.S. tour and be a successful tour for them. And I'll let you guys know as, uh, as soon as I check the show out and any updates that come along. All right. So, yes, you are absolutely correct with your guess, David. Kiss oh. sells logo, brand, music, and everything. Three hundred million. Three hundred million. So, Kiss. but I wasn't correct with my joke guess. It wasn't <laughs> six hundred and sixty-six no. million. It should have been three hundred and thirty-three million. That's what that, all right? the scared parents in uh, the United <laughs> States thought. It would have been well, I guess the rights now belong to a company called Pop House Entertainment Group. It's the company behind ABBA's popular live Avatar show. They play. Oh it. yeah. Yeah. So that's going to be fantastic. <laughs> Everybody loves that. Uh, yeah. They're yeah. going to be launching the same Kiss Avatar show in America type of deal. Use the same technology, rather. Uh, Gene Simmons, Kiss, is the tour Kiss the touring band is over. What Pop House will do with our images, our music, our persona is unlike anything anyone has ever seen. Uh, Billboard reports that the Kiss Avatar show will open in an unspecified U.S. city in 2027. Interesting, huh? 2027, huh? That far ahead. Unspecified. I don't know. It's going to be in Modesto. I, <laughs> I would guess Las Vegas. Yeah, I had to probably. Guess. I mean, well, I mean, isn't this kind of the thing we were talking about with the uh, the uh, virtual reality, like the VR? Don't you think that this, this kind of a... Uh... Yeah, it definitely falls right into that. It's yeah. a virtual band. It's like an, a band... And uh, what's to stop them from doing this with like Jimi Hendrix or yeah any of the you know and they they musicians of put the past. you in the uh, what's the place that you two you two is at right now the orb <laughs> oh the sphere the sphere in right Las Vegas it's a big giant uh, big <laughs> oh giant yeah TV I mean that, screens this, and this would be right up that alley for sure people running around with VR headsets. And Gene Simmons with another. a towel on his head. With a towel on his and head. His like, makeup what is going on off? there? Uh, oh, it's his ma makeup. He's ma about to wipe his face. Yeah, it's like at the end of the show or something. I see. He's all. But anyway, so there you go. $300 million for Kiss's catalog. Uh, not a bad deal for them, huh? Yeah, right? I mean, shoot, I wish I had something <clears> to sell for $300 million. New album came out on Friday. A bunch of new albums, but one of the highlights was the Black Keys new album, Ohio Players, featuring a bunch of musicians on this guest musicians that was the kind of the theme it's got beck on there noel gallagher zz tops billy gibbons dan the automator uh juicy J. they cover the whole gamut there on this album it's a pretty solid album too have you heard anything from it yet no not yet uh, it's really good we'll listen to it off i the do air. like that they've got someone from three six mafia I, juicy J. that that track is beck and juicy J on that track and oh really yeah i think I, i'm pretty sure it's a, it's the same track and it's pretty good. I'll, I'll have to play it for you. Is it bowling themed like the no, album cover? Uh, no, it's, there's nothing bowling themed about it other than uh, just I guess it's a Midwest pastime. I don't I know. <laughs> I went bowling this week. Yeah, nice. I uh, how'd you do? Well, we played two games. On the first game, I had like one of the worst scores, <laughs> and I told everyone, "Mark my words, <laughs> I'm, I'm coming. I'm back. coming back, and yeah. I'll be number one." And you know what? <laughs> And you got it? I did. Nice. I killed it the next wow. game. That's good. All right. Well, uh, yeah, so the album's out now, and we'll talk about a bunch of new albums that are out this week in just a bit. But real quick on ACDC, selling 1.5 million tickets in just one day. Uh, wow. Just, it's pretty awesome. Uh, booking venues for the tour wasn't easy to schedule, I guess. In Europe, they got the Olympic Games going on in France uh, during the time uh, that their tour is going to be happening um, in May through August of this year. So... European football championships happening in Germany as well. The weather was another factor for the outdoor shows in Italy and Spain, where sh uh, shows last summer had to be delayed due to the extreme temperatures. So they were trying to figure out ways, you know, all that stuff got canceled. Man. So I think that's why there was such a big response as well. As once they announced these new dates, you know, it's kind of rescheduled from last time. They're like, you know, all about it. So. Uh, this is a, a unique lineup of ACDC as well. Newest member Chris Cheney uh, on the drums, Matt Logg, Steve Young, Angus, and Brian Johnson. The show runs, the shows will run May through August of this year. So uh, it looks to be a big, big European tour for them. All right, we got some birthdays this week. Let's get to a birthday time. Happy. Happy. Happy 
Take it All away. right. These are birthdays from uh, April 1st to April 7th. So we've got uh, Jimmy Cliff was born in 1948 on April 1st. Greg Camp of Smash Mouth, born 1967 on the 2nd. David Robinson of The Cars, was born on the 2nd. Um, he's born in 1953. Mike McCready of Pearl Jam was born in 1965 on the 5th of this month. And John Oates of Hall & Oates, born in 1949 on the 7th. Mick Abrams of Jethro, Jethro Tulls, born in 1943 on the 7th. John Barbarata, uh, or sorry, Barbata of Jefferson Airplane and Jefferson Starship is 79 years old. Sebastian Bach, lead singer of Skid Row, is 56. Wanted to throw that one in with the Trailer Park Boys. Uh, yeah. He's, he's made a couple appearances on their show. And uh, I, I also highlighting the uh, the clogs. They're wearing Danish clogs, the, the, uh, the, the those wooden... Like what are they called? Clogs? Yeah, yeah. They're, they're little little Danish, <laughs> d- Dutch, yeah. Holland Dutch. Clogs. Yes, yes, yeah. Uh, I have a question. Yes, was was he on um, the Gilmore Girls? Who Sebastian Bach? Yeah, maybe. Could have I, been. Think I don't he know. Was. <laughs> I, I have no idea. I think he was in the band on the Gilmore <laughs> well, Girls. Then, yeah, if he was in the band, probably. <laughs> Dude, okay, I'm gonna have to look that up. That's hilarious. So they did a cameo there. Yeah, no, I think he was like a character. Oh, like a like recurring a, yeah, it was character. Like a recurring character. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. That's okay. hilarious. All right. uh, Emmy Lou Harris. Yes, the great Emmy Lou Harris is 77 years old. Doesn't she look fantastic? Yeah, she looks beautiful. All right, good for her, man. All right, we got some trivia. Trivia time. Let's go. This week in rock and roll history, trivia. Yes, this week in rock and roll history trivia. This week, April 4th, 1913, this blues icon is born. He passed away in 1983. Who had their birthday this week? Was it Robert Johnson, Muddy Waters, John Lee Hooker, or was it a little-known artist by the name of Catfish Crosby and his old-timey jug band? David Crosby stands over a makeshift fishing hole on stage and catches catfish with his bare hands like Huckleberry Finn while freebasing cocaine from Paul Bunyan's Bowie knife. <laughs> so it was uh, a popular show at the yeah, time. Yeah, it was. It you got like, 1913. I mean, well, I'm trying to figure out what a makeshift fishing hole. Yeah, right. Well, on stage is like. I think it was just like a, a bag barrel. Of, it was they just like yeah, a barrel. A barrel of water with yeah, fish in it. A barrel. And he would stand over it with a fishing. Kind of easy to catch the fish though. Yeah, but I heard tr- that. I heard that the whiskers on a catfish hurt you when you touch them. Oh, really? So I wonder if he maybe I think he, I he think got he a jolt out of that. I think he liked that. Got a yeah. jolt. Yeah. Um. <laughs> uh so i'm gonna say let's let's go with robert johnson robert johnson let's go with robert johnson muddy waters muddy waters Look it was that. muddy waters born on this uh he well, died when i was a year old really yeah that's right that's right Look at that. uh muddy waters there april 4th 1913 what a legend all right new rock and metal albums out this week david take it away man all right alpha wolf half living things I think this one's in the category of uh, the Master P kind of uh, style. Yeah, that's, I mean, but it's got like the painting sort of like aesthetic. That's pretty cool looking. But it is interesting that it is heavy metal and it's very, um, very much looks like a hip hop album. Yep. All right. So So there you go. A little bit of uh, fusionism. Fusion. All right. Bayside. uh, There are worse things than being alive. I guess, yeah, that's a good point. Bayside. <laughs> is that like Bayside High? I, I guess, yeah. From, uh, from uh, Saved, Saved by, by the, the Bell. Bell. Yeah, that's yeah. them. That's Saved by the Bell now. Bayside. They go hang out at the yeah, Max. At the Max. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, the Black Keys, Ohio players that we were just talking about. Yep. Uh, Blacktop, Mojo, Pollen. There you go. Cars covered in pollen. Pollen. Yeah, look at that, pollen. Disbelief, Killing Karma. Traditional. Good, good. Era, Cure. Another quite traditional looking album. Hood Rats, Crime Hysteria, and Useless Information. Yeah, let's take a minute to appreciate the album cover here. Yeah, I'm liking that. Okay, so we've got a, got a, a DJing a, police officer yep. with a, you know, sort of a 
middle class dad. And then looks like there's a like priest. An engineer being burned and at the stake. Another uh, cop enjoying the fact that they're lighting someone on fire there, uh, like a, a little pyre, funeral pyre. Yeah, what's the meaning of this? And there's a dead police officer on the ground, isn't there? Yeah. So there's With the little a air blast. horn. I don't know. He's got a, a little... Um, or is he drunk, maybe? No, he's blowing a party favor um, thing there. <laughs> I like this. He definitely does look drunk. He's got a bottle of There's something to that. I'd like to hear the story. <laughs> Hood rats, can you reach out to us and yes, uh, please. Tell, us, tell us what's going on there? Horndall, head hammer man. Um, Iron monkey, spleen, and goad. Yes. That's a cool vinyl. That's pretty cool looking. All right. What else? Uh, which vomit? <laughs> oh, no, wait. White dog, <laughs> double dog dare. Yes. And then, yes. And then we got witch vomit. Funeral sanctum. A very good family. You know, if you got the, f the kids in the car and you're going some to witch uh, vomit. going to Disneyland or, you know, out to dinner. The going over the hill and through yep. the woods to grandmother's Throw house. Throw that one on. Throw that one on there. All right. All righty. Movie TV entertainment news. Hart is going to be on the Tonight Show this week um, on April 8th. Anne and Nancy Wilson, uh, they're re, you know reunited now, recorded, touring together. you got a huge tour, so they're going to be doing that with Joan Jett and the Black Hearts, Cheap Trick. Don't miss them on uh, Fallon this week on April 8th. Check out their live performance. That's good. Uh, speaking of that, also on April 9th, uh, late show stuff here, Conan O'Brien. Set to make his long-awaited return to the Tonight Show, uh, first time in 14 years since he was abruptly fired from that position. If you remember all that crazy controversy, I don't really remember that. Yeah, it was kind of wild. Um, I guess Jay Leno said he could have the job, and then um, decided he wanted his job back for a while, and oh. kind of did this switcheroo. And so when when Conan O'Brien was on a show, he wasn't on the Tonight Show. Did he have like some other? Oh, there you go. The late. Yeah. The late late, late night, night with Conan O'Brien. Yep. For almost two decades. And after his departure from the Tonight Show. So he did late night with Conan so O'Brien. Right? Then he switched over to the Tonight Show. Tried to do the fired. Tonight Show as the next host to succeed Jay Leno. Jay Leno didn't want to go at that time. I guess he changed his mind. And that was the whole dick move part about it. Like he's like, yeah, sure, you can be my successor. And then he changed his mind. But then he, he had back. already given up the late night right. with Conan O'Brien. So then he went on to host Conan on TBS for 11 years. So okay. he did Conan after that in 2009. He's been doing that for the past 11 oh, years. Oh, I, really, uh, I haven't really paid much attention. I didn't know that. Yeah, and it's TBS. It's, I didn't get the TBS. Yeah, it's a shame. I mean, you know, uh, it's it, it never was really that popular because of he's all of that. He's a funny guy. He is. He's fantastic. He's hilarious. So... He's going to be on April 9th, so he's going to be talking about his new series, Conan O'Brien Must Go, which is going to be streaming on Max. So there you go. And um, Conan, and so the new, but the new Tonight Show, that's Jimmy Fallon, right? I always forget all the different right. ones. I guess, yeah. Okay. I don't know. Okay. Tonight Show's with Jimmy Fallon now, I guess. Yep, that is true. Yeah, because we were just looking at that Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon. So there you go. Okay, okay. Yep. All right, uh, Melissa Etheridge, docuseries, uh, spotlighting female prisoners in her hometown. It's coming on Paramount Plus, and it's uh, spotlighting. Um, so I guess she wrote an original song inspired by letters from five female residents of the Topeka Correctional Facility in Kansas, in her hometown. So she did this cool thing with Paramount Plus. Uh, it's called I'm Not Broken, and it focuses on these prisoners and uh, her plan to create and perform the song for the women. It aims to shed light on the challenges faced by incarcerated women, substance abuse, generation trauma, all that stuff. So, you know, it's, she's hoping it'll raise awareness, provide support, struggling with addiction. Sounds like a good cause, right? Yeah, that sounds cool. And so it's on Paramount Plus. It's called I'm Not Broken. And I, I don't, it doesn't say when it's coming out. So uh, sorry about that, but it looks to be coming out soon. All right, news from around the world. Watching a solar eclipse can cause permanent eye damage, so don't do it. I can't believe how many people are thinking that they can just like, <laughs> I'm just going to wear some regular sunglasses or peek out my blinds or, you know what I mean? You could be <laughs> our, 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 our president blinds. where he's just like, yeah, up didn't in the yeah, sky. Trump did that. He's like, nah, I got, I I got the glasses. best. I have the, be I have the best. Uh, it says uh, they surveyed a thousand people. Uh, and here's what they said. Uh, they said, 10% of Americans mistakenly believe that an eclipse can cause natural disasters, sleep problems, and mental health issues. 
So they all think that solar eclipse is kind of, you know. So it can do all those other things, but they don't mind looking at it, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> like the one thing that it does do. It says they thought that wearing sunglasses and briefly looking at the sun were safe for the eyes. However, even just a few seconds can lead to permanent blindness without any signs or symptoms. Yeah, I had a last, the last one, I think in 2017, I had, I was teaching and I had, I was doing a class when the uh -huh. eclipse happened and I wasn't going to take my students out to look at it, like, even though I am a geography professor, but <laughs> I was like, no, I'm not taking them out there. This is too yeah. risky. Right. Then the passing period happened. The students from, you know, from the outside came in and I had a student like, did you see that? He said to me, did you see the eclipse? And I was like, no, nah, I couldn't see. I was like, did you see it? And he's like, yeah, I looked at it. And I was like, did you wear something over your eyes? Yeah. He's like, no, nah, I just like squinted my eyes. <laughs> I was like, no, he's like, my eyes are fine. I was like, you realize that your retina gets damaged yeah. and that damage can like hit you later. Yep. Um, the so, macula all the way in the back yeah. there. And the you, you do not want macular degeneration. Nope. Paul Harvey will come after you and so. give you all kinds of vitamins and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> don't do it, kids. Yeah. Don't do it. All right. What do you think about potatoes not be uh, may not be a vegetable much longer? Oh, not considered a vegetable? Yeah, because I guess they're saying because of all the starches and things. 14 lawmakers have written to federal agencies protesting a possible change about this. I had no idea. All the Idaho lawmakers, <laughs> right. it's a vegetable. That's the only one I know how to eat. <laughs> it says um, potatoes provide nutrients, blah, 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 like pota potassium, calcium, fiber, but they're higher in carbs and have a higher glycemic index. Changing classification of potatoes could impact school lunches, other nutrition programs. That's why it's kind of like, they, oh, here's your serving of vegetables for the day, and it's French fries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, really, did not didn't we already know this? Like how is this yeah. just getting to the government? This shows you how screwed up the uh you know, how screwed up the the way that uh lobbying these works. lobbying for yeah. like they go in and figure out how they can make a french fry a a healthy option. Yep, and that's all lobbying from the potato industry. So, it's finally starting to get around. Uh, but, you know, hey. I mean, shoot, guys. Don't you realize you, you don't have to call it a, a vegetable. We'll still eat it. Yeah. Right. We but love those things. It's the way that they want to lobby for but that. Yeah. It really has to do with the fact that they can keep, I mean, shoot school lunches. They, school lunches are really not nutritious. They aren't it's like because this shit's in there. I'm told that, you know, I was talking to someone who does the purchasing and stuff like that. And I'm told that they like fortify them and they give them like fake, like apparently the pop tarts are like nutritious pop tarts. I was like, I don't know if I believe that they're actually nutritious, <laughs> but that's like the idea. So yeah. it's like, yep. you know, you take these, these, uh, these kinds of things and fortify them with you, nutrients, you fortify them yeah. with nutrients. Oh, now it's okay. Now you've, you've, you know, very good point. Well, we'll see. No macular degeneration. All right. Weekly WTF this week, uh, NASA analyzing a large object that crashed through this guy's home, uh, Florida man. Uh, it, they're determining it, whether it came from the International Space Station or not. They is think it one it of is. those like poop? <laughs> no, this is actually a battery. Look at this thing. Oh yep. my gosh! Uh, they're saying it's, it's corroded. Like, yeah, they're saying it's like the size of a football. Um, came through the roof of his house at two thirty-four p.m. just in the middle of the day. Uh, it was caught by his ring security camera, according to the UPI U.S. Space Command recorded the re-entry of a piece of debris from the International Space Station around the same time over the Gulf of Mexico with a trajectory taking it towards southwest Florida. And what, what the deal is, um, uh, his son was at the time, but uh, no one was injured. I don't know why I deleted the part about it. It was this thing up here. They were um, supposed to be taking used batteries back into the Earth's orbit, and supposedly um, some kind of a malfunction happened, and the batteries all came out. And so they all just like went random places, which is like terrifying to think. So it, how many batteries? Are, it was a lot. I, a lot. So I it's like we just us. know about the one that hit Florida. Yeah. What about the one Who that knows? hit? Uh, <laughs> good golly. Who knows? Yeah. So. And really, that's a, what are the odds? Yeah. Florida's just that little skinny thing pretty, sticking out there. Pretty crazy odds, right? It was supposed to land in the water there. They always plan yeah. for that kind of area. And then, yeah. So pretty wild. So luckily nobody was injured. So. All right. Mom's psychedelic toting adventure goes wrong. 
sounds like a great uh, title of a book. Um, <laughs> 37-year-old Samantha Gonzalez smoked toad venom in Mexico in search of a spiritual experience, but she got more than she bargained for. I guess here's a picture of the um, the little, like, ayahuasca fucking tent that they did this in. There's, like, some little, like, tent. And here's a picture of her and her husband. Looks so wholesome. Yeah, it looks just like a regular, you know. So it says the experience caused her to vomit, feel waves of terror. She says, you feel like a baby again. And it was scary. It was scary for me. If I were to recommend this for somebody, I would recommend something where you get to spend the whole day with a facilitator. While some doctors believe that toad venom could be useful in treating anxiety and depression, medical experts warn the venom can be very dangerous and has a high potential for abuse. With a trauma-informed therapist like myself, it's one of the most effective ways, uh, effective treatments for PTSD, Dr. Mike Dow said. Without therapy, it can re-traumatize people in a scary way. So she Is that her right yeah, there? Yeah, it's her. This was like her, her little... Right uh, before she yeah, the toad. she was trying to take this <laughs> yeah, this journey to like you know enlightenment self discovery tra- you know helping with her trauma great. heard about you know <laughs> toad venom <laughs> and then uh, she was just okay well I could have told her that toads and licking toads is nothing well, she but destruction it. smoke and toad smoked toad smoked venom. toad venom okay because I I don't have told you this story but. I, when I was living in Thailand, there was this, there was this, uh, we lived in the front of a house and then the owners like lived in the back and they yeah. had two pit bulls. Okay. And one day, you know, these pit bulls were really nice. You know, they were like the first kind of exposure I had close interaction with pit bulls and they were really nice. And then one day we came home and the pit bulls were licking a toad. Uh Oh, and they, you know, this toads there and it's, you know, all, you know, and the t- pit bulls are just licking the toad and they're foaming at the mouth just, oh. and then, and they, and their eyes got all dilated and they were kind of staggering around. They were getting high <laughs> off. Of yeah. This toad. They both were doing it. And after that, they were absolute monsters to each other. Oh, really? They, they almost killed each other oh, and we God. had to deal with it every single day. So it was like those, maybe what happened was <laughs> that they got enlightened and they saw the truth of their relationship. Yeah. And they were like, yeah, this is it's right. hatred. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. Maybe that was the, maybe that was the truth in the light, but they were not nice pit bulls after wow. that. They had to put them in cages. Or they went cages. too far and like they had a bad acid trip, a bad acid and they trip. Just never, they just came never came back. <laughs> They were just, you know, casualties of the acid scene in, in Thailand. Yeah, man, alive. <laughs> of the toad. And the licking... toad looked like that. It was kind of yeah, kind of like that. Fat toad. But, I mean, this is a different country, so. Yeah. Interesting. Crazy, huh? Very interesting. Careful with those toads, man. All right. Okay, so before you see this picture, there's this viral picture that's going around on TikTok. Okay. It says, what you see first in the picture uh, tells something about who oh, you are. Oh, yes. You love those, love right? This. Okay, so look at the picture. Tell me how horrible I am. Tell me what you see first, okay? I see a woman looking sort of into the sky. That's what I see. Okay, you see the woman's face first, right? Yes. Well, uh, according to TikTok creator Mia Yelin, it can this can apparently determine whether or not you're easygoing or likable. The, the this picture depicts hand drawn flowers and a woman's face, which the artist notes that what you're going to see first can offer insight into your personality. If you saw the flowers, you're super easygoing and likable. You always see the best in others and have a hard time saying no because you don't want to disappoint them. Okay. And uh, right, but if you saw the woman's face first, you're an emotional and passionate person. Okay. After relationships end, it can take months to move on, and you can't help but miss what used to be. You're a major overthinker and very smart. Whether you commit to something, you make it happen. You like to keep your circle small and have a few close friends as you find it difficult to trust most people. So, But, but my question is, though, like, I saw a woman's face made out of flowers. Right. That's my question, too, is that... I feel like these things are designed. I was designed. like, look, a, a woman's face made out of flowers. And look at how the way that the flowers are, like, shaped around this face as to, like, push and shape 
your direction of view to, yeah, to yeah, this, towards right? Towards the face. And then these flowers on the bottom are almost like just like an afterthought. Like it's meant purposely to obviously look like a woman's face, but it's all made out of flowers. So I so feel like she wants everyone to think that they're uh what was it? Emotion what was it? The uh the second one. I, yeah, what, what where was it was says I'm uh uh, if you I'm not the, super easy going. You're an emotional I'm and passionate, passionate person. I'm a passionate and emotional yeah, person. Yeah, and you're an overthinker and very smart. So, I don't know. You I, know my feeling on all these things, things are just is? BS. They're just total BS. My feeling is this. There's no such thing as personality. It's all context. <laughs> right, yeah, that's Whatever pl- like position you're put in, you can change. Someone's quote-unquote personality I know. can change. You I know, agree. It's just like, what are they experiencing in life? So, well, thank you, Mia, Yilin. You yep. taught us a lot. But yep. you know what? I like the painting. It's and it's pretty. a nice painting. Yeah. yeah. But it is silly. All right. That's it for us this week, guys. Make sure you always tune in. Rocknewsweekly.com on our YouTube channel, at Rock News Weekly. And we'll see you guys next week. All right? Have a good one. Peace. See ya. Bye-bye.